So my last couple of runs in Fallout 4 have all been character based, and I thought it was about time to tackle something a little bit more, shall we say, traditional? I had this idea after I finished running through the Fable trilogy at level 1, as the concepts are pretty much the same. With that in mind, today we find out, can you beat Fallout 4 without skills or perks? Full disclosure, this would have been called a level 1 run, but there's no way to actually stop yourself from leveling up in Fallout 4 due to it happening automatically once you acquire enough experience. Fortunately, unlike Fallout 3 and New Vegas, we aren't required to immediately assign a perk upon levelling up, and instead the point is saved and can be used at any time, or in other words, I will simply just not assign any of the points that I get. As for skills, well, during the introduction of the game you have to assign a certain number of them, but let's not sit here and pretend like I can't just download a mod to set them all to 1, or if you're on PC, use console commands. Oh, and also, as a bonus rule, I cannot use any Creation Club items. Probably pretty obvious as to why, most of them are stupidly overpowered. I should also bring this up before someone mentions it, no I can't pick up bobbleheads as they will also increase my stats. Now I with all that out of the way, let's begin. As soon as I begin at the vault entrance I access the cheat terminal my pit boy and go through each of my special stats and lower them to 1. And just as proof that it worked, here is the perk slash level up screen, and as you can see, indicated by the single gold star underneath each special stat, they are in fact as low as they can physically go. Exiting the vault, and to me, it seems rather obvious where to go first. I may as well head to Concord and help by Preston, because, after all, where else would you go at level 1? While I play through this segment, allow me to go over exactly what we're working with, and what the plan is going forward in the run. With every stat at 1 and no perk points for the rest of the challenge, I will need to rely on powerful weapons and armor more than ever, as I won't be able to offset my damage and defense by increasing the relevant skills. This means I will also only have access to rank 1 modifications for weapons and armor. For certain weapons, such as shotguns, that's honestly not too bad, but for things like the 10mm pistol, something that can usually carry you through the entire game if you spec into it right, well, it's probably going to stop being useful by around the second half of the story. It should come as no surprise that other than just being a good sport, I'm helping out with the Minutemen's business here so I can acquire some worthwhile supplies from the Raiders' corpses I'm creating, and you guessed it, the power armor that's on top of the roof. I literally have glass bones and paper skin, so becoming the makeshift Iron Man is by far my best option for long term survival. While we are also on the topic of factions, the plan is to side with the railroad for the majority of the story. Simply put, when compared to the Minutemen, Brotherhood and the Institute, they don't have any huge scale battles that would be an almost guaranteed death sentence for the player. Well, except for when you take the fight to the Brotherhood, but don't worry, we will get to that later. As you can see, wiping out the Raiders is about as simple as ever for this early in the game. The only major difference I would say is the 1 point in endurance makes me a lot squishier than I would like. That 1 point means the maximum HP increase we get by default per level is going to mean jack squat, also leveling up and hoping to hide behind a wall of hit points is not an option. Even though I don't need to be, I'm a little more cautious about the death claw than I normally am this time around, although I'm going to chalk that up to the fact that he was able to hit me somehow through the building. Regardless, it doesn't take long to fell the beast, and after getting our paltry reward from Preston, I do my usual rounds of heading down the street to grab some ammo from Carla and Trudy after turning Wolfgang into a human shaped ocarina after I've carved all of the new holes into him. While trading for ammo and weapons, it dawned on me that while this is all well and good, I'm not going to get very far in my power armor if I don't find more fusion cores. So I returned to Sanctuary to repair the suit as well as assign a few level 1 upgrades to my weapons, and then I set off on the hunt for at least a few fusion cores to get me to Diamond City. The first one was simple enough as it is literally just sitting in the small mole rat cave underneath Red Rocket, obviously the mole rats aren't going to be an issue like they ever are. Next was the robotic disposal ground just east of Sanctuary as I attempted to take some from a barely functioning sentry bot. I don't actually think there's a way for me to currently beat the thing in a one on one fight, so to circumvent being eviscerated over and over again, I use the same terminal that reactivates the bot to activate its self destruct sequence instead and just make sure I'm outside of the blast radius. Like most sentry bots, he drops two fusion cores, meaning I have more than doubled my supply. Three cores should be more than enough to travel to Diamond City. However, I am rather close to Satellite Station Olivia, which also houses another core, as well as weak raiders and more minigun rounds. I don't even have to really contend with most of the raiders to be honest, as thanks to the frag grenades that I got from the post box in Sanctuary, I was able to wipe out a majority of them with a single explosion and then picked off the survivors with a 10mm pistol. I also grabbed the locket for the Abernathys, but I never ended up returning it. There is no real need to involve myself in actual side quests this time around, as all they're going to really do is level me up, which again, other than a couple of hit points per level, is completely worthless. If anything, it's probably bad if I level up too much as my enemies will get stronger, whereas I'll be sitting here trying to figure out which end of the gun kills people. 
After some more repairs, I head off to Diamond City, and other than a couple of raiders that were harassing Trudy yet again, I never encountered any resistance on my way there. I'm still good on weapons, armor, and ammo for now, so I'm really just here to mark it on the map for later. So, once I do that, I continue heading east to do the exact same thing for Park Street and Good Neighbor. Well, I may have caused a small incident in Good Neighbor as I rustled the feathers of the townsfolk whenever I stole a fat man in a mini nuke from Cleo. I didn't really have a use for it in mind, but I mean, it couldn't hurt to have one, right? Besides, with the power armor I have, I could probably tank a hit from it if I decide to fire it in close quarters. Speaking of close range, I did at the very least procure a combat shock on the legal way by purchasing it. This is because I'm going to confront the underground gangsters now, and having a close quarters weapon seemed like a very good idea. Look at this place. And it was in fact, a very good idea. One to two shots was enough to take out even the strongest of the triggermen. I did end up switching back over to the 10mm however. Simply put, I had a lot more ammo for due to the triggermen acting like pinatas of the stuff. It doesn't take long to reach Nick, and then by proxy, Skinny. I of course had considered this may be the toughest fight yet, not that that's saying a whole lot mind you, so I made sure to come prepared. Not only did I make sure to save ample shotgun shells for the encounter, but I also saved a critical to guarantee maximum damage to Skinny's terrible choice of headwear. A few follow up shots put him down, and then the rest of his backup followed a similar fate. Credit where credit is due, Darla and the boys did manage to destroy both of my power armor's arms, so I'll need to go back and fix them. One good side effect of not being able to upgrade my equipment all that much, is that I am never lacking materials, so repairing the armor is of little to no concern. I leave said armor in Sanctuary while I help Nick break into Kellogg's house, so I'm not wasting power. I also may have indulged in a little break and entering of my own, as I make my way inside Arturo's house, and steal the mini nuke that he appears to be using as a paperweight. After some snooping and the use of a dog whistle, we are now ready to track down Kellogg. Thing is, I was starting to become greedy with collecting fusion cores for seemingly no reason, although this will come back to help a lot later. In any case, what I am trying to say is I made a pit stop at the Federal Ration stockpile on the way to Fort Hagen, and my primary reason for the visit and slaughter wasn't just because I felt like it. There is in fact a total of three fusion cores up for grabs, and I just couldn't say no. The first one I took was in the back of the suit of power armor, which I made sure to carefully approach from the south, after swinging around the side of the base, because if you alert the guards, one of them will more than likely rush the suit and get inside. The other two are in generators, one inside and one out. Of course it makes sense to grab the outside one now, so after I continue to get more use out of the shotgun and pistol combo, I snag the thing and then enter the building to continue dispensing my wrath where I grab the third core. I also put down all the raiders I could find, and then stole their food for good measure. I figured that way if I missed one, they would starve to death, and therefore, I would still get the kill. Anyway, enough procrastinating for things I really don't need, it was time to rip open the cereal box and claim the prize inside. Since, for whatever reason, are seemingly very weak to energy weapons. Which honestly just seems like a massive oversight to me. Basically, I just used the combat shotgun or my own laser musket to take out the first few when you enter the fort, then when I gathered enough energy cells, I could comfortably use one of their institute rifles against them to speed the process along. By the way, you all know what Chekhov's gun is, right? Well, let's just say in the context of this video, Chekhov's Fat Man may have been more appropriate. As you might expect, Kellogg does not survive the miniaturized nuclear warhead making contact with his torso. The synths on the other hand don't die in the blast somehow. No matter, the shotgun quickly puts them in their place, and now it's time to head to Good Neighbor. Except, much like the Doomslayer video from last week, given that Fort Hagen is on the west side of the map, and is my most southern fast travel point, I thought it just made the most sense to go to the Glowing Sea now, so that I may unlock the fast travel point for Virgil's Cave. I had another run in with some raiders on the way, and these ones were just a little bit stronger than what we'd fought up until this point. Again, not to sound like a broken record, but the combat shotgun does absolute work here. Now, to be honest, they would have given me a first class ticket to the Pearly Gates if it wasn't for the power armor. Even so though, I have realised by now that the armor's health is draining faster and faster due to the increased damage everyone else is doing. By this stage, I am basically fast travelling back to Sanctuary and repairing the thing after every other shootout. Much like before, just heading south from here leads to a fight with a Deathclaw, followed by a couple of Rad Scorpions. I was smart enough to still be carrying around the minigun from the start, so this was essentially just a repeat of what happened in Concord, the major difference this time being I was hopping around like a rabbit on crack as I was using the rocks in the area to try and avoid the swiping. I put away the minigun when dealing with the scorpions, and instead brought out the laser musket once again. I think it really says something about the balance in the Fallout 4 when two weapons that you get from what is essentially the tutorial are able to efficiently and effectively kill creatures that are occupying what is hyped up to be one of, if not the deadliest zone in the commonwealth. That is without any upgrades I might also add, bar the musket which I was able to upgrade from a 2 crank to a 3 crank. 
Well, with these overpowered weak weapons, I make it to the rocky cave that will very soon become Virgil's cave, as I then make my way back to Nick to discuss the giblets left around Fort Hagen that were once part of Kellogg's brain. We then travel to the memory den and pretend to be interested in the bit while skipping all of the optional dialogue, and immediately fast travel back to the newly christened lab cave and see about finding ourselves a courser. So, the gunners were tough. Despite what you may think, my power armour, much like the synths mind you, doesn't really do a whole lot in the way of energy resistance, for whatever reason. I will say I was prepared for something like this to happen, and as such I have a fair amount of stim packs along with other healing items. Best of all being, I have close to 10 Nuka-Cola Quantum Bottles for some instant full heals. This was another situation where I just fought energy with energy, as the laser musket was able to obliterate most of the gunners with little to no problem. Probably because most of them aren't even wearing any armour. Okay, so full disclosure, I initially went and drugged up Mama Murphy so she could have one of her stupid visions, and somehow give me the deactivation code for said courser. It is definitely the smartest way to go about this, as it not only guarantees I don't get turned into dust, but it saves resources and ammo that could prove invaluable for later in the run. So yeah, that all sounds good, but here's the thing. The second brain ship of the day requires a special touch, so we take it over to the Old Norse Church, and against my better judgement, I don't start mashing the right trigger as soon as the lights come on. Are you going to kill me? I would certainly like to. I know you would. As I said, I'll be siding with them for a majority of the story, so I suppose it's off to the switchboard to deal with the synths there. Because apparently, building a teleporter for the real road and allowing them to send an agent into the place where they have been trying to infiltrate for god knows how long is less important than whatever it is they left behind at their old base. The laser musket continues to be my go-to weapon, as while it is slow, the damage output is just too good not to use. Plus, all the synths are dropping fusion cells upon death, so I don't even need to think about the ammo for now. When we push through the final few synths, we get the prototype we were sent to reclaim, and as a reward, Deacon hands me the Deliverer. I cannot upgrade it past its current modifications, but even still, it does more damage than the 10mm, despite using the same ammo type, so it's just going to straight up replace it for now. I put it to use on a few of the synth survivors before heading back to the basement and becoming an official member of the train society. Okay, now they are finally ready for the teleporter, better late than never I suppose, and so I use the materials I've been hoarding like a magpie and infiltrate the institute. As I'm working undercover for the railroad, that means I'll just be following Institute's faction quests up until the point where the game says stop. After meeting up with the leaders of the science club, I do converse with Liam and Z1 for a bit, just so that I'm on top of things for the railroad. Long story short, I have to go to the Polymer Labs in Cambridge to get a password for Liam. Upon entering, I just immediately shoot the Mr. Handy without hesitation, as I know it will end up locking me deeper in the lab, and I really cannot be bothered to play scientist today. I think I've mentioned it before, but I always have a miserable time trying to navigate this place. I know it's not large or difficult to walk through by any means, but I think I do the railroad quest line so little that I legit just forget most of the layout of this building. Eventually, the gift of sight lets me notice the correct path, and after more ghoul butchering, we can grab what I need, return to Liam, and get properly started on fake working for the Institute. My first proper task for them is heading to Libertalia, and recalling the Raider synth back to the Institute. This is music to my ears, as while the Raiders will hurt me, because, no duh, one of them has a fat man, so, more mini nukes for my own, and right before encountering the synth, we get the French shotgun. I don't know why being French makes it do 25% more damage than a normal combat shotgun, but that's just the logic we're going to work with today. Anyway, we recall Gabriel to have him reprogrammed, and then I deal with his final two guards with the help of said new shotgun. Returning once more to the place with blinding walls, I am once again asked to help in freeing the synths, this time with a more direct approach, by murdering some of the synth guards so that the workers may escape. This is over in a flash, thanks to me picking up the missile launcher from that one gunner, who is usually a pain in my neck during the climb in green tech. Well, for once I am not on the receiving end of the missile, and instead get to witness its very effective and quick results. Back to father, and he is none the wiser about the missiles being fired off wildly in his basement, and instead he sends me to deal with the situation of Bunker Hill, aptly named the Battle of Bunker Hill. I'm sure it is a battle, not that I pay much attention to it. The railroad and Brotherhood spend so much time fighting one another, that other than a few turrets and my courser friend whom I portray at the end of the quest, I don't have to fight anyone when making my way to the escaped synths. On the way out, however, I am in a bit of a pickle, as now I'm facing down my first group of Brotherhood Knights. Let's not beat around the bush, they hit very hard, and they can take a lot of punishment. This right here was probably where I used the biggest chunk of my healing supplies. I also cycled through a bunch of different weapons while trying to find out what worked best. The shotgun was probably the answer, but even that took multiple shots to get any real results, 
and by that I mean it took a very long time to break their armor. That being said, after I managed to take out the first one with multiple close range shotgun blasts, I looted him not only for his laser rifle that did 27 damage, but his power armor. While I obviously still have a set of my own, his T60 is a pretty sizable improvement over my basic T45. I also grabbed the laser rifle because if their armor is anything like mine, then energy weapons are probably my best bet. Sure, I have the laser musket still, but I think its slower reload speed has finally caught up with it because trying to out DPS a knight with the thing just wouldn't work. Turns out I was right thankfully as the laser rifle did make very short work of the remaining brotherhood along with the last two vertebrates. Granted, they were already heavily damaged by the railroad, but just let me have this moment. When all's said and done I return to Sanctuary to repair the broken T60 so that I can use it for myself and then it's back to Institute for a congratulations and a free teleport trip to Mass Fusion. Now Mass Fusion had the potential to be an absolute travesty as the elevator ride would have been the death of me. Thing is though there is another much faster and easier way to get to the Beryllium Agitator, one that doesn't involve cosplaying as a fish in a barrel. God, power armor is so broken in this game. Grabbing the MacGuffin was simple, and honestly, dealing with the ensuing robots was nowhere near as bad as it could have been. This is because, once again, I came prepared. This time, thanks to the Battle of Bunker Hill, I was able to get my hands on one of the Knight's Gatlin lasers. Considering that they take fusion cores for ammo, and I am currently pretty well stocked with them, I'm able to unleash a swarm of lasers that quickly envelop the sentry bot, blowing him up just like that, and adding two more fusion cores to my arsenal. With mass fusion out of the way, there's only one real mission left I need to do. Yes, there is technically more going on between now and when the Brotherhood attacked the church, but all it really consists of is knocking out a random scientist and making a terrible speech to the people of Boston. Skipping ahead to the Brotherhood's assault, and right as it begins, I am handed the railway rifle. It does 100 damage per shot, so by all means it is my strongest weapon in a sense outside of the Fat Man. It makes very short work of the normal Brotherhood troops, and it sort of slows down the knights, at the very least when they're not all focusing me at once. Glory tries to give me some sort of dying speech, but because this is literally the first time I've spoken with her, I really don't care. I use the rifle a little bit more, but ultimately I switch off to the Gatlin laser as its DPS is honestly just through the roof compared to everything else. In no time at all, I have created a few more dust bunnies in the church, and now it's time to get rid of the Brotherhood once and for all. Arriving at the police station and I make a very powerful opening statement by firing a mini nuke straight into the middle of the Brotherhood's defences. Naturally, this takes out most of the soldiers outside, allowing me to enter the building and clear out the stragglers with my new favourite weapon of the week. It even makes short work of the vertebrates bringing in reinforcements, which is a super nice feeling by the way. From here, me, Tom and Deacon take the vertebrate to the Prudwin, and now it's time to get in touch with my inner solid snake as I leave my armour behind and begin to stealth my way through the ship. If you get too close to any of the named Brotherhood NPCs, you will need to pass a speech check, otherwise they will go on alert and open fire. Fortunately, you can easily avoid them with some careful manoeuvring and plant all three bombs while they're none the wiser. Sadly, we don't get to leave stealthily as I of course want to hop back in my power armour and despite the fact that it's sporting the Brotherhood paint job, it is not classified as a disguise and as such they open fire on us as we leave. Not that it does them much good, from the moment I stepped aboard their fate was sealed and now they must all watch in fear as they are forced to reenact the Hindenburg. All that leaves is a nuclear option, right? Not exactly, no. <laughs> you see, with the Brotherhood killed off in a rather anticlimactic fashion, that means that the only two factions left are the Railroad and Institute. The Minutemen do not count today, as Preston is still waiting to hear back about Ten Pines Bluff. What this means is I could help out the Railroad, free the synths, and run through the Institute until I reach the reactor and blow it up. Or I could simply waltz back into the Old Norse Church, position myself just right, and proceed to launch a mini nuke into the centre of the hideout, dealing with everyone in a matter of mere moments. Any survivors were met with a Gatlin laser to the face, effectively ending the railroad right when they were finally starting to make some real progress. Doing things this way has some very interesting side effects on the ending. Like, Sean still dies, don't get me wrong, but since I don't have to leave between completing the quest for taking out the railroad and then the Brotherhood, he just immediately goes from talking in his normal voice to that of his dying one. Nope. Not a problem at all. I regret that it came to this, even if you don't. Hello, Sean. Ah. There you are. I've already heard the news. But of course you wouldn't be here if it weren't a success. Also, as you can see, he is not in his bed, so when the cutscene ends and he is supposed to die, he snaps into the resting position before briefly defaulting to an A-pose, 
and then stands upright as the screen fades to black, ending the game and proving yes, you can indeed beat Fallout 4 without skills or perks. Here is my level up screen right at the end, just to prove that I never upgraded any special stats or used any perk points. I've gotta say that honestly was nowhere near as difficult as I thought it would be. Turns out none of the leveling really matters if you have access to good weapons and armour. Or maybe this was just an elaborate way to show off how utterly broken power armour is in Fallout 4. I feel like this would be a lot more difficult in Fallout 3 or New Vegas, but who knows, I'll probably try the same challenge on them one day. Regardless, that's going to be in this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like and you're interested in more challenges in the future. Feel free to subscribe to one of these videos every week. My name is Nerbert, thanks everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.